Today we pray, forgiving God, your mercy endures forever. Make us know the extent to which we are forgiven, that by your grace we will become a forgiving people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In Exodus chapter 14 is the account of the final stages of Israel's liberation from Egyptian captivity. It is an account of a people on the move. It is the final push. They have to cross the Red Sea and their former oppressors are short on their heels to recapture them. The narrative that follows will perpetually impact their national psyche, identity and heritage. The divine deliverance will determine and provide the theological foundation of their worldview. At a moment of unimaginable crisis, where it seems that the story will end in a dismal anticlimax, God, through his servant Moses, parts the sea, creating an escape route with high walls of water on either side. The Egyptians chase after them, however. And while the Israelites walk on dry land, the Egyptian chariots start to get stuck. As God's people reach the other side, God in a single swoop of the returning waters make a final end to Israel's history of slavery. The Song of Moses that recounts the story becomes something of a national anthem, which is, um, has repeated references throughout the Bible, including the New Testament. It is a song of liberty, but not just of political freedom, but of a liberation of conscience, freedom to make value judgments, and seemingly having the power and divine verification to distinguish between life and death. The implication of this liberty is significant um, in history, as one religion is judged by another. It therefore allows us, even in this day, to judge the textual narrative in our pursuit to determine the nature of God and people's motives. The seriousness of the narrative has the outcome of shaping the value system of Israel and the nations that will later adapt their views um, and adopt them for themselves. They have a unique opportunity to decide how they will treat slaves. Ritual systems and calendars will offer periodical release of debts, slaves, offenders, and the redemption and restoration of land. As a people determining to be holy, they want to consciously distance themselves from a slave worldview. Institutionally, um, the, uh, enshrined in God's moral laws, they become a forgiving people. Forgiveness in response to the Egyptian uh, oppression is not disempowering. Forgiveness is choosing not to associate with the proud. The Egyptians were so blinded by their pride that even after severe plagues, they still go after the Israelites into the sea without working the obvious and logical risks. That's just plainly narcissistic, um, which comes to the fore in the narrative. And so the reborn Israel subsequently trusts in a justice system of enduring values, fashioning a community that conducts themselves around the value of life, not the enforcement of death. Even as grim as some of the ceremonial rules may seem to us today, thousands of years later. The Apostle Paul, the ultimate Judeo-Christian scholar, builds on this heritage when writing to the church in Rome in chapter 14 of his letter to them, instructing them to exercise freedom of conscience, saying that they shouldn't argue over opinions and grant individual freedom. This stems from personal value judgments, the eternal freedom we offer ourselves and setting us free from our own demands and less internalizing societal expectations. Um, Freud even um, observed this in his psychological research. Therefore, we too 
are crossing a sea. Pride in hot pursuit and surrounded by death. But it is testament that God wants to liberate. The proud, such as the Egyptians, will eventually destroy themselves as they compare and want to boycott the path of freedom of others. The realization is, however, not always that, that obvious. Uh, for the same track that leads to freedom leads also to destruction, um, with each party claiming righteousness. The silence that follows after the sea metaphorically executes judgment is either deafening or the void with which songs of gratitude can be filled. The personal salvation that is to be experienced is not to hold people and ourselves back in the past. In dealing with interpersonal and public relations, the Apostle Paul is not advocating necessarily uh, for relativism as there are value judgments to be made. But the root of it is that he is describing in salvific language uh, the awakening of consciousness to the present moment. He frames this within the dictum that we are the Lord's, whether we live or die. It's a phrase that is part of our funeral liturgy, uh, which is a poignant time to assess our lives and the often pettiness of our opinions. In reference to our Lord Jesus Christ, he himself in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, says that we should forgive 70 times seven times in a hyperbolic expression of complete forgiveness. Appreciating where we draw um, and base our understanding and philosophy of judgment and forgiveness from. When facing the personal free choice of forgiving heinous murderers and slave owners, Jesus' instruction actually gives us the ability to make complete value judgments that therefore offers a better life, enabling us to weigh up whether we want to be enslaved to anger and resentment. This is, of course, to be distinguished uh, between uh, mercy and grace, which are even higher forms of virtues. But it's worth considering holistically, as we are resentful towards ourselves for not being the people we would like to be, people of absolute selfless moral character, service, humility, and excellent achievement in all spheres of life. But of course, we all have regrets. Jesus tells a comparative story to this effect of two servants. One had an unrepayable debt uh, forgiven after pleading for mercy, but executed cruelty on a fellow servant who owned him but a small amount. Subsequently, justice was done upon finding out the truth of the person's character um, and his ignorance of refusing to replicate forgiveness. It seems that the, the utopia of a just society is difficult, if not impossible, to reach. The notion of forgiveness, as deducted from Jesus' story, empowers the innocent by safeguarding the rights of people to demand the truth. Without forgiving the repentant and truthful, the compulsive behavior of the proud will not lead to the truth and the self-awareness of shortcomings. Without forgiveness, the powerless will remain the victim of judgment. This is the essence of flourishing. But how do we deal with big ethical questions in the world and in South Africa, such, such as systemic racism, gender-based discrimination, and exploiting the poor through corruption, um, who needs restorative justice to be given to them? And I believe that conversations can start when personal freedom from proud, tyrannical voices of self-accusation um, for having allowed injustices to be done to us. In other words, shame and guilt um, to, to fester in our, in our lives. The final push towards, in, towards a new start is the awakening that in Christ, we don't have to fight for forgiveness. In Christ, forgiveness and justice is achieved. 
The practice, however, is to forgive 70 times, seven times in an ongoing enlightenment towards truth and justice. During lockdown, the human population of the world turned inward. It may just be the greatest psychophenomena in history. The introspection can contribute to depression, but also offer an opportunity for Jesus to lead us to perfect forgiveness. A lifestyle not of self-inflicting and abuse of others, but of being nation builders, of taking people along as opposed to beating and suppressing them into submission. The final push is of breaking the cycle of rejecting forgiveness. Charlie Chaplin's final speech in his satirical movie, The Great Dictator, says it well. I'm sorry, but I don't want to be an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful. But we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women and children, victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, there. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die. And the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate. Only the unloved hate, the unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery, fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man nor a group of men, but in all men, in you. You, the people, have the power. The power to create machines, the power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world, that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason, a world where science and progress 
will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite!